Hey Axis No Ice players, the good captain here. Welcome to my fourth video in the Axis No Ice Classic series, and this is the first strategic video. Russia goes first in this version of Axis No Ice, so this t the title of this video is R1, or Russia's Turn 1. And the format for this video will be the same for the next four. I will start by demonstrating what Don's essays say you must do to maximize each power's strengths and abilities. One thing about the essays is it's very insistent that there really is just one course of action to take that maximizes each individual power. I'll cover the what Don's essays say to do and then I'll transition into my recommended course of action. The one exception is Russia because of the restricted attack variation. Don's essays assumes that you're playing with the uh, restricted attack balancing rule that's in the back. Most of these optional rules on the last page of the manual are balancing rules to help the axis. And this one in particular says that the USSR player is not allowed to attack until the second turn. He does, however, state what to do if you are allowed to attack. So there's kind of two versions of what Don's essays say to do as Russia based on if you're using that rule or not, and then I'll transition to what my recommended course of action. So, uh, one last tidbit, and that is I'm not going to go over tech dice. Tech dice comes before purchases, but neither the essays nor I recommend purchasing te tech dice on any of the first turns of any of the powers. So, uh, the first turn build recommended for Russia is 8 infantry. That's why I have this out here. Uh, Russia starts out with 24 IPCs, and both the essays and I recommend building 8 infantry. It's just a solid build. There's like one, arguably two more variations of this first turn build for Russia, but 8 infantry is a good lead. Uh, so I'm not going to spend any time on that. We'll drive straight into the restricted attack version of Don's essays. So we'll start in the Soviet East Front, which is uh, where Japan is over here. Essentially, you're going to be consolidating in Yakut, and that's how you pronounce that. I actually checked the pronunciations of uh, what most of these territories I'm about to pronounce, so Yakut is going to get six infantry of the seven that can get can reach it. You're going to leave one infantry in the Soviet Far East, and you're going to have what amounts to six in Yakut. The reason you leave one infantry in the Soviet Far East is it's kind of an adage in Axis and Allies, especially in this version, that you don't want to leave a an IPC open for free to your opponent, especially one that's worth two IPCs, as in this case. And the reason is it takes one ground unit for your opponent to take a territory of yours that's vacant. And generally speaking, to make sure that you get a territory, it takes at least two ground units plus support, even if you're only going up against one infantry. So the return on the investment for leaving one infantry behind is pretty big. Especially in this case, it makes sense with Japan beset on all, uh, by all three players uh, in, in Asia. So we leave one infantry in the Soviet Far East, and now the tank will actually move back two spaces to Novosibirsk. The reason why you're moving it back here and not putting it in Yakut is Yakut is strong enough and then from Novosibirsk, you can reinforce Sinkiang, India, Yakut if you needed to. You're taking advantage of the, uh, this vehicle's ability to move two spaces. Uh, this is a good, good, solid place to put it. So that's the Soviet East Front. And on the Soviet West Front, uh, it's not mentioned exactly what to do with these naval units, but um, I don't think... There's, it's too much to say that you should reinforce the British, uh, and that's to provide two more soak units for the British battleship. Um, it's highly likely that German naval and air units will be attacking this fleet here in the next turn, and by moving these Soviet, the Russian units here, it really helps get that battleship a second or even third shot off. And then finally, you are to consolidate in Karelia. You're going to push everybody up here. Okay, oops, we missed the tank. Get that taken care of. So you'll have three tanks, two fighters, 12 infantry, and then after you add in the eight builds, I'm sorry, you're going to leave two infantry from the Caucasus in the Caucasus. 
So you'll have uh, a total of 18 infantry when it's all said and done up in the Ukraine or up in the Karelia SSR with three tanks and two fighters. And you just leave those two down in the Caucasus to deter the Germans from attacking. And that's pretty much it. Uh, that's your first turn as Russia. Now, that's not all the essays address, though. We're going to go ahead. I'm going to reset the board now and transition it to what you should do if you are not playing with the Russia restricted rule. So let me reset the board and we'll go through that. Okay, so this has been reset and now Russia has a combat move and a combat phase. And the essays state that you should really pretty much attack everywhere you can. There's a little bit more to it than that, but I'm just going to move the pieces and kind of describe what I'm doing. First, the Russian Navy should attack the German Navy south of Finland, Norway. And the Russian fighter out of Karelia should attack the fleet there as well. <clears throat> and next you're going to be moving every unit you can into the Ukraine SSR. Including Russia's other fighter and three tanks. And then in the Soviet East Front you're going to be attacking Manchuria with five infantry and one tank. Okay, so this might look a little weird, but here's the rationale. The rationale is uh, that you're not trying to take either the Ukraine SSR or Manchuria. You're just, what this is, what both of these attacks are, what the essays call a strafing attack. And a strafing attack is an attack designed not to take territory, but to inflict casualties followed by a retreat. In Manchuria, the objective is to knock off one, or if you're lucky, two Japanese infantry before re retreating. Okay, the Japanese start out with three over here. Killing that one, theoretically speaking, harms the Japanese more than losing two Russians. The Japanese only have so many infantry on the Asian continent at start that limiting them before it gets to their first turn puts them even into even more of a bind. And then, so they'll, they'll attack once, or maybe uh, twice, but really you're just killing one or two Japanese infantry, and then retreating to Yakut. Arguably, you might want to leave one in the Soviet Far East again, so that it's not, there's nothing free for the taking for the Japanese. So it might be just four infantry attacking here, and one tank. But do not, you do not want to take this territory. Even if you roll very well, make sure to retreat. If you don't, then the Japanese player, you, if you've just given the Japanese player a huge cherry, uh, they can hit you, and they should hit you, with everything they've got. Their battleships and transports and whatnot can crush the Soviet um, East Front Army. And this army is much more difficult to replace units at because of the geography of the uh, map here. It's harder to push new infantry units out this way. And it's, Germany is much more menacing in the West, so Russia needs to build West, generally speaking. So attack and retreat into Yakut. And in the, so uh, in the Ukraine, it's basically the same thing. You might go an extra round here, because the objective is to, uh, to kill off these three infantry, and there's two tanks in there, and you want to get one or both of them before retreating. The idea is to get at least one tank before retreating everyone into Karelia. And from there, you can just... Uh, send a troop into, or two troops into the Caucasus as a deterrent to the Germans, whatever Germans are left there, and then reinforce the rest in Karelia with your builds. So at the end of this kind of turn, you should see, hope ideally speaking, Germany down to one tank and one fighter in the Ukraine, and the Japanese down by an infantry in Manchuria, with Soviet armies in Yakut, Karelia, blockers in Caucasus in the Soviet Far East, and the destruction of the German Navy south of Norway. And the fighters would of course go back to Karelia. So I think this is a good transition uh, without stopping the video here to talk about what I think about uh, Russia's first turn. And I'm not a, I don't care really if we use the Russia attack or restricted attack balance or not. I don't care if my opponents ask for it, whether they're the allies or the axis. I'm okay with it and I'm not okay with it. 
because first off though this can happen I consider this very risky if I was allowed to attack as Russia I would d not do either of these and that's because I've played a lot of war games and generally speaking I, I'm not a fan of rolling dice unless I have to or unless the odds are um, overwhelmingly in my favor and both of these um, I'm afraid of the bell curve, the ends of the bell curve. I'm afraid of doing too well or doing nothing. If uh, The easiest one to address is if you do nothing. Um, it's, the best example is Manchuria. It's, it's not crazy that f uh, four or even five infantry in a tank should cause no hits. Okay, if, if that happens, if that unfortunate situation happens, the Japanese will get three, two defenders and one four defender on you for free. Uh, and you could lose to infantry, and you've achieved nothing. Over in the Ukraine, it's a little less risky than Manchuria, the Manchuria attack, but it, the same principle still applies. I'm worried about either... Oh, and if you do too well as the Russians, let's say... Sorry, let's go back to Manchuria. The other thing to say about this attack, this particular strafing attack, is let's say you... Let's say you get one hit as the Russians and you decide to go again for whatever reason and then you get three hits which is not likely but again we're talking about the ends of the bell curve now you're stuck with Manchuria and you're gonna lose your army unless you've got a Japanese player who's fairly mediocre or some other crazy event happens elsewhere on the board before Japan's turn Japan will knock that army out and then have a free ride into the Soviet Far East and a much easier go at Yakut than normal so I don't know. Uh, to me, I just look at this stuff and I'm like, why, why set yourself up for that? Um, and now I'll transition into what I like to do as the Russians. So let me reset the board and I'll be right back. Okay, and now this is my version of, uh, or this is how I like to run the ball with Russia on the first turn. All right, I've I've done almost all the combat moves, or I've done all the combat moves, and I've done some of the non-combat moves. So we'll start in the Eastern Front over here, the Soviet Eastern Front. And over here, I pretty much do the same things the essays do, but it's a small thing, but I, I think it's a, uh, an acute difference between the essays and what I like to do. I, I withdraw one more infantry from the Yakut defense line there and add him to Novozibirsk. Now, why am I doing that? Well, I don't like too much overkill, and right now this defense is solid. With five infantry, it's a ten-point defense with five units. The most the Japanese can throw at it is a sixteen-point attack with uh, seven units. But that's exerting all three, all the fighters and bombers and everything they can throw into that territory. And if they do that, then China will survive. There's no way they can attack Yakut and. China. And if China survives, it means the United States fighter is alive and well, and this gives all, you know, and the two infantry in there. So that means the United States has options that look good. And if they're, if they exert themselves to capture Yakut, the Russians also have a counterattack option with this infantry back here. So generally speaking, Russia, or there's just as much deterrence to Japan to not attack Yakut with five as there is with six. And then Putting an infantry back here, much like the tank, but um, just less options, it allows an infantry to, to move into Sinkiang if the American player maybe wanted to build an industry at some point, maybe even on the first turn if they felt like it. It provides a little more flexibility to the Russian player in, in the utilization of their units. I just don't feel it's totally necessary for that last infantry up there. That's just how I like to run it. So this is my, how I, one subtle change over here. Otherwise, yes, I, I agree with everything. Um, over in the West, however, I play it quite a bit differently. When it comes to the German Navy south of Norway, yes, I agree it should be destroyed if you can attack it. And if you can't attack it, I attack with only one sub and both fighters. I don't attack the Ukraine. This is a pretty sure kill. You can get both those units. You might lose your submarine and who cares. And of course, the Russian transport goes to reinforce the British battleship to act as a soak unit. And I left these gas gauge markers here because of my next move. As you can see, I consolidated all the units in Corellia in the non-combat movement phase there. I haven't yet added in the eight builds, the infantry builds yet. 
because I wanted to demonstrate this. This is the thing that I do that I haven't seen anybody else do yet. Uh, although I'm sure it's been done before. I'm not saying I've invented this. But what I like to do with these tanks on the Soviet West Front, what I like to do with them is not reinforce Karelia, but to move them to what I call the blind spot in Axis and Allies, or of Axis and Allies, and that's move them down into Persia. I like to move all three down into Persia. And I would say to anybody who wants to copy this little move, I would, I would commit at least two. Don't just throw one, do at least two. But I like to do all three because, again, with, under the same philosophy I just demonstrated over in Yakut, there is such a thing as overkill, and I don't like to do too much overkill, because when I do my eight builds, I've now got 19 infantry here, and when the fighters come back after they're done, this is a 21 unit defense that can throw it with, ooh, excuse me, 46 point defense with 21 units. The best the Germans can do, uh, if this transport is gone, is attack with 16 units uh, at a 30 point attack, th 16 ground units at a 30 point attack, which means to get close to having a reasonable odds of success, they must commit most of their air force, which means if they do that, it's a high-risk attack that will spare the British Navy any attacks by the German Air Force. So it's, it's going to be a tough decision for the German player. If Actually, to me, if I'm the German player, I don't think it's a tough decision. I wouldn't attack it. It's too dicey for me. And then anyway, so that's, that's just how I like to run it here. I only leave one in the Caucasus. And then these tanks in Persia. Why are they in Persia? Well, Persia has a lot of reach. First, it deters the Germans from entering into Africa on the first turn. As, as from Persia, these three tanks offer a very strong armored fist against any first turn incursions into Egypt. It can also reinforce India, Sinkiang, it can reach as far as no, uh, Novozibirsk, or it can come back up, let's say the Germans do attack, they'll probably get mauled in the attack, but let's say they do attack Karelia and manage to take it back, uh, you've got at least three tanks and an infantry to to counterattack with. Uh, it doesn't sound like much, but there, you know, the, if the Germans attack, I'd be surprised if there was very much left up there, especially if the British Navy had to go at it in between Germany's turn and Russia's turn too. Anyway, all this to say, I don't think this is a very high risk move at all. It provides a lot of deterrence, which again, if you remember from my video number two, Containment is the Allies' number one thing, and this is in line with that strategy. And it's, it, it really takes advantage of the fact that Russia, out of all the Allied players, is the most consolidated and ready to fight. So again, it's a, I think it's a good containment strategy that utilizes Russia's um, stance uh, in the beginning of the game. So that's pretty much it. I'm trying to, oh, I will say bookmark this idea here because there's another reason that will be apparent in the British strategic video why I put these tanks here. Uh, it's just kind of it's kind of a gamey little trick, but it is kind of cool. The British and the Russians can kind of work together uh, to manipulate a situation or create a situation against the Japanese in India. Just remember that I, I did this here and, and I'll reveal a little strategy in the British strategic video, but my strategy doesn't change. I pretty much like to run this almost every time I play. If I'm playing against somebody where I can't attack, of course, I move the submarine over here just as the Don's essays, as I covered it in the first part of this video, I just reinforce the British battleship. Um, and the Germans would then be allowed to reinforce the attack into Karelia with another two infantry, uh, which ups it slightly, but you know, not enough to change my, my ideas about it. So that's pretty much it. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for watching this. Uh, all the best from the good captain, and bye-bye.